for the last time until we come back after the summer break, you're listening to the Religious Studies Project. You're also listening to Christopher Carter and David Robertson coming into your ears. Um, or indeed, you might even be reading us on a page in a transcription, although um, these, these parts aren't transcribed. They are so transcribed. In fact, yeah. um, I should not have said that. Um, <coughs> before I dig a hole um, any deeper than, I, I, than it already is, we're going to head over to Brad Stoddard. I really struggled to say the title of this interview last week. So, David, could you... It's entitled Black Religious Movements and Religio Racial Identities During the Great Migration. Good. Take it away, Brad. Hello, this is Brad Stoddard for the Religious Studies Project. Today I have the pleasure of talking with Judith Weisenfeld, who is the Agate Brown and George L. Collard Professor of Religion at Princeton. And she joins me today to talk about her new book, New World of Coming, Black Religion and Racial Identity During the Great Migration. Welcome to the Religious Studies Project. Thanks, Brad. You write in this book that this book is a study of the theologies, practices, community, formations, and politics of early 20th century black religious movements that fostered novel understandings of the history and racial identity of people conventionally categorized as Negro in American society. Which specific groups do you address, and what story do they collectively tell? The book is a comparative study of the Moore Science Temple, the Nation of Islam, Father Divine's Peace Mission Movement, and a number of congregations of black Hebrews. And I pursued this comparative study in order to think about the ways in which they each engaged questions of racial identity through a religious frame. They were all, they all emerged at the same time in the early 20th century, founded by um, migrants from the South to northern cities or immigrants from the Caribbean to these same northern cities. And I was interested in, again, the ways in which they were all thinking about black racial identity, history, and doing so in ways that uh, insisted that religion was to be part of um, these discussions. And so taken together, we get a sense of a really vibrant conversation going on in black American life in these groups and beyond these groups about race and peoplehood, who we are. Um, and I think um, one, of the, one of the ways in which people have conventionally approached race, racial identity, is to understand race as, as reality. Race exists. People are of this race, that race, another race. Um, with the rise of critical race studies and thinking about uh, the social race as a social construction, um, scholars have begun to talk more about race not as um, bio- a biological fact, but as socially produced. And in in that kind of discussion, um, which informs much of my work, people who are um, not white are are often presented as as the objects of racial construction. So race is a social construction. It produces hierarchy. It uh, provides um, tools for controlling, otherizing, and so on. Um, And so people who are so racialized rarely appear as agents in discussions about race. And in looking at these groups together, it became clear to me that, again, in these groups and in broader on um, black public culture, people were uh, were asking these questions about who we are racially, and these groups presented a really profound challenge to the conventional um, category of Negro and the ways in which Christianity had become a kind of um, uh, assumed appropriate religion. And so, taking them together, we see black religious subjects talking about race, producing race, thinking about rejecting, changing, and so on. Most of these groups, if not all of them, emerged or were founded, were created uh, within a relatively short time period. What is significant about this time period in American history, and why was it so ripe for the production of so many diverse religio-racial identities? These groups all come out of the period of the Great Migration, which begins in the um, around World War One, a movement of 
Southern African Americans rural to urban context, so the urban South, and also it's thought of um, sort of the largest element of that was a northward migration. And so northern cities see um, uh, huge increases in the black population over the, those decades through, there are various waves of it. Um, I focus from the very early 20s to the late 40s. Um, and so people are moving to cities, and on the East Coast in particular, in, um, in New York and Newark and Philadelphia, um, they are also interacting with immigrants from the, the, uh, Caribbean, mostly from the British West Indies, but also from Danish, um, French and so on. And these urban contexts become a, a laboratory for the production of all sorts of new um, cu- cultural movements, so we get the Harlem Renaissance and um, the um, cultural productions of Chicago, where uh, black films get produced, for example, and exhibited, music and literary production, and religious transformation is is also one of the components of, of the social changes, the cultural changes of the Great Migration, and while these groups remain in the minority, it's it's in these urban laboratories. Um, I, I, and there is political changes as well. We see the rise of um, rising influence of socialists and communists, and uh, Marcus Garvey's uh, Universal Negro Improvement Association is is based in Harlem, and it is also a kind of engine for thinking about black peoplehood in new ways. And so. These are people who are moving, they're born, um, the, the members who join and also the founders, they're born at the end of Reconstruction, some of them at the beginning, they're, they're born as um, Jim Crow segregation really locks down black life in the South. And then they're part of the this great migration and, and I think one of the things they're struggling with is we're no longer slaves and there was the potential of reconstruction uh, but things are not th- things are different but things are not different in, in important ways and so a kind of questioning of this the hopeful trajectory of um, the exodus for example um, questioning the the degree to which black churches can be um, agents of liberation. And what's really so powerful in these groups, for, for me, I found really interesting, is just questioning just the very terms of identity, who we are. Is this who we are? Um, I, if this is who we are, uh, a lot of them say, I don't necessarily want that. There's a story of, um, of a, a man who's, named only as as Horace X, that he encounters the Nation of Islam in Chicago in the 40s. And he had tried out, he had you know grown up in the church, he had tried out different, all sorts of different groups, political groups that promised emigration to Africa and other kinds of religious groups, and he joined the Freemasons. And uh, in the story he tells to a sociologist that he heard someone preaching on the street, this is not who you are. They told you you were a Negro. They told you you were a Christian. That's not true. I have the truth. And he, he says, I was, I was ashamed to have been born a Negro before this. And when I heard that, everything changed for me. And it's that kind of, um, uh, rethinking of identity that, that I, I found so compelling and wanted to know more about. And it is, I think it's precisely the convergence of all of these things in the urban context that makes that possible. When you were describing Horace X, it reminded me of the what we scholars refer to as the seeker mentality, but it's alive and well in a different community much earlier, as you're describing it. Yes, I found a number of, of cases like that um, where pe- in, in all of the groups people said, I tried this, I tried that. Sometimes they're um, doing multiple things at the same time. And it when I started the research, I was revisiting some of the um, secondary literature and things I had read many times um, 
before, but hadn't thought about it in relation to writing about these groups. And I, I looked back at a document um, by Miles Mark Fisher, who was an African-American minister and also a um, University of Chicago PhD after he wrote this. He wrote a piece called um, Organized Religions and the Cults. And he was advocating for the inclusion of some of these newer movements in the, the uh, U.S. Census of Religious Bodies that was coming up in 1935, I think it would have been. Um, and he's making the case that these are um, not numerically powerful groups, but that they spoke about something that was going on in African-American life. And, and in order to understand religion in American life, the Census Bureau should survey them. And he he also told a story. He said, you know, it, it's very hard sometimes even to tell, to draw a line between churches and the the cults, as he called them. And he told a story of some of his Sunday school teacher who um, had also been a member of what he characterized as a cult and was did that and was also a Sunday school teacher and was buried out of the church. And so, it returning to that piece sparked for me um, this sense that, as he made clear, the line is not that uh, sharp between them, that people are moving um, sequentially through these or trying them out at the same time. And the other thing that became really important for me was to think about these groups as members of these groups and the kinds of conversations they are engaged in as part of a broader set of conversations in black life at the time. So not to marginalize them as, as um, strange people who put on fezes and rejected all sorts of, of things to live off on their own. And, and, you know, they had, they were boundaried in lots of ways, but the, the kinds of questions they were asking were not strange for that period. They were actually very much a part of, of, uh, what I call the kind of public culture of race in black America. Scholars have discussed all of these groups before. In your book, you bring, of course, your unique analytical lens to it, but you also bring new sources and new groups of people. So can you speak, um, when I think, when I speak of new people, you focus a lot, or to a certain extent, on Caribbean people and their impact on these movements. Um, so can you speak to your sources and the groups of people who are included in your narrative? Sure. One of the, as you said, scholars have written about these groups, the um, the more science temple and its founder, Noble Drali, the Nation of Islam, and um, W.D. Fard and Elijah Muhammad, Father Divine, and um, and also uh, scholarship on the on Black Hebrews, Ethiopian Hebrews, um, and all of that. Those are those are texts that consider these groups individually and focus primarily on the leaders and the theologies that they promoted. And and I was interested in what it would mean to put them together in one study and think about. As I've said, the way they, th way they talk about race, reimagine race in a religious frame. And I ended up, um, calling that religio racial identity because for them, and as all of the founders preached, religion and race are inextricably linked. And once you understand your religious identity, be it as an Asiatic Muslim, as the nation of Islam, and uh, more science simple would talk about it, or an Ethiopian Hebrew, or for Father Divine's movement, raceless. Once you know that, you know what your religion is supposed to be as well. And um, uh, so, Islam for the nation of Islam was created for the Asiatics, so, and you can't separate those things. And it, I felt in reading some of the secondary literature that. Uh, people were, scholars were really interested in how to talk about the religious transformations that these groups um, represented, but didn't really take seriously these claims of Asiatic or Ethiopian identity. And I wanted to know, I, I, I see them in reading the, the 
sources, primary sources, as for these people, inextricably linked. And I wanted to know how, if you are Horace X and you hear a uh, minister of the Nation of Islam preaching, you're not a Negro Christian, you're, uh, you're an Asiatic Muslim, how did Horace X go about being that thing that he came to believe he really was? And so finding what um, the average members did was really a challenge. And this is, I think, why most of the texts really focus on the theologies of the leaders. And so I ended up um, benefiting from some recent archival uh, sources. At Emory, for example, has a Father Divine collection that has a huge number of letters to and from Father Divine that give the texture of um, life in the movement. So those are not unconventional. But I ended up using um, um, vital records, the census, and government documents like draft cards that are, all, many of them, um, in available on Ancestry.com. And reading those kinds of documents that I, I just kind of I stumbled on them as a way into this, showed me how profoundly important it was to members of these groups that they be represented in public, in um, official documents with the, the racial, religio-racial identity they had claimed and with, in some cases, the names they had chosen to reflect their true identities. And so we see in the draft cards these men going in and and there's a pre-printed category uh, uh, column of racial categories listed and ne white negro uh, asian filipino indian say oriental on the 1942 form mm -hmm. and these men say none of those categories fit me and so i have to you have to write moorish american and they were successful in doing that, and what those kinds of documents that were, again, completely unexpected way of, of finding, finding names of average members, but also, um, unexpected, um, source for finding out ways to kind of calibrate the, the stakes and their investment in it. So if you're about, you know, potentially being drafted into the military, um, and you're, you're struggling over, um, how you're represented racially on this forum, it means a lot to you. Um, and I see it on the census and other kinds of things like that. I learned all sorts of things from the census about residential patterns of these groups. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time on Ancestry.com. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> With pleasure. On the, on the topic of both new sources and new um, social actors, um, I, I was interested in... The, the role of, of immigration from the, from the West Indies, from the Caribbean in this story because they, they are there. Um, it is Marcus Garvey's, as he was a Jamaican immigrant who founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association and proposed a kind of a sense of global black identity. He did embrace the label of Negro. But he really generated a sense of black pride, connection to Africa, um, uh, investment in collective political engagement in a way that was new for the, the period. And in a lot, and he was, he was from Jamaica and a lot of the people in the movement when it was headquartered in Harlem were from the, from the Caribbean. And this gets erased a lot, very often, I think, in African American history that these are people who come from a very different social and political context in many ways to the U.S. and religious context as well. There are commonalities, but they they have cultural differences, and they're negotiating that. And um, the these movements emerge in part out of those uh, cultural negotiations across communities and. But it also turns out that the most of the, the Ethiopian Hebrews are Caribbean immigrants. The vast majority of people in the Moor Science Temple and the Nation of Islam are uh, African Americans. 
And Father Divine's movement has a mix. And so it, this project was interesting to me to think about, again, black racial identity across not just African American, but sort of thinking about how these groups were in conversation with one another. Um, I think I, I didn't do as much as I had hoped um, to attend to the cultural specificity of, of West Indian immigrants in in the story, but um, so I hope somebody else will pick that up. As I read your book, you're suggesting that membership in one of these groups required the person to undergo a rather thorough process of reimagining, and I have a couple questions about that reimagining. How did membership in one of these groups, and I'm sure, I know it varied from group to group, mm-hmm. but uh, what were some of the major ways that it involved them reimagining their sense of self and even their bodies? And that was the one of the ways I tried to answer that question of if yesterday you thought you were a Negro Christian and today you are um, have been persuaded that you're you know a raceless child of Father Divine or Ethiopian Hebrew, um, how do you do that? And so I looked at these practices of of self fashioning that they're they're different as you said in each each of the groups, um, but there I did find some patterns in that. Um, for many of them, changing their names was important. And in the more science temple and the nation of Islam, rejecting the name, the, the, um, well, in the nation of Islam, rejecting the slave, slave name and reclaiming what they talked about as a, um, as a kind of tribal name or a true name for both more science temple and the nation of Islam was, an important step of either kind of separating from old self and moving into the new self. And in Father Divine's peace mission, they rejected their, what they talked of as mortal names and uh, took spiritual names that reflected their new status. So these processes of separation from the former identity and taking on a new one that locks you, that, that reflects your true history as they talked about it was important some of the groups um, took on forms of dress that also spoke about that history, that lineage, the more science temple, um, the most um, notable one with uh, adopting Moorish dress, and the fez for men and turbans for women, a red fez. And again, the draft cards were a really interesting source for me for thinking about the meaning of, of that and the ways in which it, men who were registering for the draft thought of that fez as actually part of their bodies. And it was Noble Draw Lee enjoined them to wear the fez at all times, but when you see on the draft cards that they list that as a physical characteristic by which they can be identified as if you know it's they have a scar or missing digit or something like that, it it revealed, again, how much they saw it as kind of remaking their body in a profound way into this being that that could be recognized as its true self now. Um, names, dress, some of the groups reimagined skin color, adopted different kind of terminology for talking about the surface of the body. More Science Temple, again, um, used the term Olives. They talked about themselves as olive-skinned moors, and it didn't matter that there might not be a correspondence between what a beholder might think they looked like, but it was a theological way of talking about skin color as, as connected to Allah, and so their scripture, uh, the catechism explained that. And then practices of, of diet, Again, kind of separate you from your old self and you take on a true diet that remakes you and keeps you healthy. All of these groups actually had a deep investment in um, longevity and thought that the, in different ways, the, the poison diet, the wrong diet of enslavement and negroness and even Christianity to a certain extent, um, had debilitated black people as individuals and black people as a whole. So they developed certain diet, you know, dietary practices, either feasting or fasting in different cases, certain foods. And, um, and also they all had, um, 
investments in, you know, in healing. So sometimes through medicine, sometimes through diet, and they all, they all actually believed you could live, that black people could live for a very, very long time, if not in Father Divine's group forever, um, and that enslavement in the Americas had made that impossible, but they were being restored to that possibility. Part of that reimagining also imagine or also involved them reimagining their sense not only geographically but historically. Uh, it seems that the dominant nar- dominant narrative at this time in African American communities was to understand the, their sense of or their position in history relative to slavery, and these new uh, religious movements in this period provided a whole new understanding of history. Can you speak to that? That was one of I think the great appeals of. The, um, these movements and collectively they do this same kind of work. And, and in some ways saying you are not a Negro is saying the same thing. Your history did not begin with slavery. The Negro is, all of them would argue, a racial category that it was produced only in America and, um, and, or through slavery in the Americas and that um, it, it was a, a containing trap to imagine yourself that way and that God didn't make you that way. So then one has to say, well, who are we, right? What is our history? And so they all insist that in, in one way or another, that black history um, began before slavery, which of course we know, and, and fills that, that in. And so in some cases, it's they're arguing that, so the more Science Temple says um, we're actually the descendants of, uh, we are Moroccan, born in America, and, um, and then also uses the Bible to trace back even further. So it's, there is a biblical co- connection, but the more Science Temple wants to orient people to the geographic space of Morocco, and um, use that as a way of talking about the beginning of, of history. Ethiopian Hebrew congregations, again, use the Bible to talk about biblical history as African history and African history as biblical history, and they, they are interested in Ethiopia, but there are also other geographic locations where, in Africa that they're interested in. And... Um, for Father Divine's peace mission and the Nation of Islam, I, it's less a geographic connection, although the Nation of Islam is very interested in Mecca. And for the peace mission, Father Divine's kingdom on earth is where you know, he's there and he's created this utopia. But their approach to rejecting the history of Negroes and enslavement involved not geography but time is how I came to think about it and so the nation of Islam you know, there's a lot of uh, in African American Christians and also in the um, Ethiopian Hebrew groups and the and the more science simple there's a lot of engagement with the Bible and looking for where we are and how to fit our how to find our history there and the nation of Islam says that's just throw that away because even from the beginning of time, from the moment of creation, that's where we are. We have to get rid of the Bible tells just the whole the whole story wrong. And um, and Father Divine time approaches to say um, race is the product of the devil. I've returned. He's also very engaged with the Bible, though. Um, I have returned to usher in a new heaven, a new earth. Heaven is not some far off thing. It's here now. And so we start from now. You can enter my kingdom if you do all of these things. And um, you're not a Negro. That's from the past. And being a Negro will, is why you die. And if you reject all of that, you can live with me forever. So Nation of Islam projects it back to the moment of creation and Father Divine projects it forward into an eternal future. There's a great, um, uh, he would send out this Christmas and New Year's card in the late 40s. Um, 
that had his his image and Mother Divine, his the Mother Divine, the second his wife, and it said, "One eternal Merry Christmas, one eternal Happy New Year." <laughs> Very good, thank you. Well, I'd like to uh, say that this is a this is a phenomenal book, and I can imagine it finding a home in quite a few religious studies courses, actually. So, best of luck with the with the book, and thank you so much for your time and your insights. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, that was wonderful. I'm so good to hear from Brad, and another excellent interview. Um, keeping up that American theme um, that we've had uh, running throughout. Past few podcasts. Uh, normally, at this time of the the uh, episode, we'd be telling you what's coming up next week. But what's coming up next week is nothing. It's a holiday next week. Yeah, and and the week after, and the week after that. Um, now, this doesn't mean you know um, regular um, sort of folk who've been with us for a few years will know that we we have a, a break over the uh, northern hemisphere summer. Um, from the end of June, and we'll come back um, mid-September. That doesn't mean that the site's going anywhere. Doesn't mean that our social media feeds are going anywhere. Absolutely not. Doesn't mean that our editors at religiousstudiesproject.com email address is going anywhere. So you can certainly mm-hmm. keep up with um, a bit of um, news and reportage um, over the summer. And and over the summer, uh, Chris and I and all of the other editors will be uh, making suggestions for uh, some of our favourite interviews of the last year, and perhaps even from further back, mm-hmm. um, and popping them up from time to time to rotate the, you know, the featured one on the website, and we'll pop them on social media as well. Pulling some things out of the archive, which is pretty big these days, so it's quite possible there's stuff that you haven't heard that mm-hmm. you might like. Yeah, and we're also going to be building up our um, rack of interviews uh, for the. 2017-2018 academic year and um, we've already got a couple in the bag and we've got a few conferences and things coming up we have we have four recorded already that, uh, that i know of hmm. so if you're going to bsa sacral um please say hello to sammy bishop yeah he'll be there representing the rsp if you're going to be at the basr in september and there'll be quite a few of us there. So. If you're in the EASR as well, there'll be uh, representatives there, including uh, Hannah Lettinen, mm-hmm. um, a long-term and, member uh, of the team. Hans van Eigen. Indeed, Will. Um, I, I, there's probably other conferences that I can't think of just exactly, now. Exactly. Um, so do look out for us there, and we'll be back in mid- mid-September. Um, <coughs> and we'll be back in mid-September with um, some excellent... New shows and another full academic year. But, uh, you know, on behalf of all of the team at the RSP for the last uh, year of episodes, thanks, thanks for, for listening. listening.